this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and here's something neat and different from Lenovo, and actually from NEC as well through their partnership. This is the Lenovo La VZ and the La VZ 360. The 360 is the moment the convertible hinge goes 360 degrees. The regular La VZ is a non-touch screen model. Otherwise, they're identical, very well spec, extremely thin two pounds or less. These are pretty amazing machines, but they're not perfect. I'm going to look at them now. So here they are, the Lenovo La VZ and La VZ 360, because these are identical other than the touch versus non-touch screen and the rotation, be it 180 for the non-touch model or full 360, we're reviewing these together because everything else is the same on them. The keyboard, the internals, you name it, and even the dimensions. Just a slight difference in the weight. First off, uh, you know, <laughs> everybody remarked at this at CES Trade Show 2015 that this has got to be one of the most insanely light laptops. The, the heavier one is 2.04 pounds. The lighter one is just under 2 pounds, and that would be the non-touchscreen version. That It just feels, given the size of the device, it's standard 13.3-inch footprint, absurdly light. You can see here we have ports, which is refreshing. We've seen some... <clears throat> laptops from Apple that have just about none, even though they're incredibly thin, 16.9 millimeters thick, which is quite thin. That's 0.67 inches. So that's the power button on the side. Even the non-touch model has the power button on the side, which is interesting. Usually that's done with touchscreen and those convert, that convert into tablets, so you can have access to the button even in tablet mode, but it's always going to be there. Our LEDs for indicating sleep, charge, all that sort of thing. Your caps lock button, really useful place to have a caps lock button there, don't you think? Anyway, it uses Lenovo's standard charging connector, the rectangular one, and comes with a standard Lenovo 45-watt charger. Got a lock slot right there. And on the other side, two USB 3.0 ports, a full-size HDMI port. We applaud that on something that is this thin. Full-size SD card slot, and here is your combo mic headphone jack. As you can see, it's got a pretty much a matte black finish, which jibes with Lenovo's designs pretty well, even though this was really developed by NEC, and Lenovo got in partnership with NEC to, to sell computers in Japan, and also now, obviously, worldwide, and they've extended that agreement that started in 2011 all the way through 2026. So it's going to be going on for a while, folks. You don't have to worry about this being a one-hit wonder, and they're not going to be doing this anymore. It is pretty much unchanged from the NEC version, which is sold in some places as NEC business computer as a Versa Pro. On the bottom here, we have ventilation. Bunch of very tiny Phillips head screws. If you unscrew those, you can remove the bottom cover and have access to the internals. And we'll show you in just a second what those internals look like. Surprisingly, given how thin and light this is, it's actually reasonably serviceable. The RAM is soldered on. You get 8 gigs of RAM, so you don't have to worry about only getting a 4 gig model. It's only 8 gigs. And it has an M2 slot for the SSD. It has a 256 gig Samsung in both of our models. That one would be upgradable yourself if you sourced an M2, typical long style gumstick length M2 drive. Wireless card is also socketed, the battery is in there, so if you need it to service to replace it, whatever. You do not have to remove the rubber feet to get the bottom cover off happily, so it's just the exposed screws right there. So that's the good news. Hinge is also robust. Whether well, you get the, the touch or the non-touch model, you get a fairly robust hinge on it that looks sort of like a Lenovo style hinge even though really this was, again, designed by NEC. Some ventilation over here. The fan is right in this area, and it exhausts out over here. Obviously, we have cooling here. What's remarkable is that both of these are Core i7s. That's the standard factory configuration here with the 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gig SSD, yet the fan's not obnoxiously loud, and they don't get that hot. You will feel heat here if you're doing something like playing Bioshock Infinite, which... I was doing with this. This just has integrated Intel HD 5500 graphics. This is not a gaming laptop, obviously, but you know what? It really can hold up under some heavy use without hideous thermal throttling happening, without getting too hot, without getting very loud. It's impressive engineering. It really is. The speakers are not impressive engineering. They're two teeny little guys that are just about the size of the grills, as you can see right here. 
worst audio I've heard since the Sony Vio X. If those, those of you out there are old enough to remember the Vio X, it was the super slim and light laptop Sony came out with really pretty teeny ran on Intel Atom. They had to do that at the time because nothing else would fit in the design. Beautiful laptop in many ways, but the audio didn't even rival what today's smartphones could do. The same thing here in terms of volume and fullness, I've heard smartphones that sound better. And I don't even mean like HTC boom sound speakers. Thank God there's a headphone jack and Yamaha audio. So through headphones or external speakers, it's not so bad. So first we're going to look at the non-touch model, which opens completely flat. So for those of you who want to give presentations or something like that, and this is a matte display. And if we switch over to the touch model, like most touch screens, though Lenovo does make some touch screens that have a matte anti-glare coating on them, it opens up too. It's glossy, obviously, and it folds over into tablet mode. Now, there was a brouhaha when this first came out because Lenovo marketed it as doing the tent mode thing, which uh, obviously we have it in tent mode right now. The thing is the display is upside down. It doesn't automatically rotate. Now you can manually rotate the display if you want in tent mode. Or if you close it into tablet mode, Indeed, this display will rotate, and then you could open it back up to tent mode like that. So you could use it like this. Now, or sometimes it switches back. You notice that? So you, you, it's hard to predict what it's going to do. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, you can manually rotate the display. But the keyboard and the trackpad are not... You see, I'm doing things back here. The keyboard and the trackpad are not disabled unless you put it fully into tablet mode, and that is the way NEC designed it. That's that's life. If you buy this, it makes a very light tablet. Certainly at two pounds, it's pretty easy to handle and nimble. Nice stuff right there, but it is not designed for tent mode or the otherwise known as presentation mode right here where you'd be resting the keys on the table and, and goodness knows what would happen. So something this powerful, this thin and light, it can't be cheap, right? No, it's not. The non-touch model is $1,500 and the touch model is $1,700. So not cheap here. I mean, you do get that Core i7, a pretty good size SSD, ample RAM, and a 2560 by 1440 Sharp IGZO display. Either way, you're going to get that Sharp IGZO display. And that's an IPS-like technology that uses less power and is fairly bright and has pleasing colors, as you can see right here. Now, one thing, out of the, out of the box, the calibration was hideous. It was calibrated to 7,900 degrees Kelvin, it should be 6,500. Much too cool, kind of washed out, so I use our Spider 4 Pro Colorimeter, which I also use to, to measure brightness and contrast and all that stuff for each of the things that we review here, and calibrated the display. I'm just going to show you what the difference is like. I'm going to turn it off. So, out of the factory. So, so from the factory, very washed out and bleh, so don't be disappointed if you buy it. it. There is hope for it. It just needs some good calibration. For those of you who don't own a calibration device, they cost around $150 or so, or you might be able to find some folks' calibration files that they have done from their own calibrations to use for your display. Inside we have Intel 5th generation Broadwell CPUs. That's the latest and greatest available from Intel. And as you might guess, it runs Windows 8.1 64-bit. Is Intel 7265 dual-band Wi-Fi 802.11ac with Bluetooth 4.0. Another weird thing about both of these, at least on ours, it wouldn't see 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi at first, which is pretty darn weird. So we had to go into the adapter settings and actually enable, instead of BG mode, ABG mode, and then start working on 5 gigahertz just fine, and we could make use of AC Wi-Fi, and then speeds and performance were good. I don't know. Really can't imagine why it was shipped like that, so it wouldn't see the five gigahertz band. But if you buy one and you have that problem, it's not defective. Just go into the Wi-Fi adapter settings and change the band selection support to fix that. So what's not so great about this? Uh, the keyboard. By the way, it's very thin and light because it has a very interesting casing. It's magnesium lithium. It feels kind of plasticky and it feels kind of light. I mean. This reminds me of the carbon fibers, Sony Vios, the high-end ones. Some people love them. Other people complain that they felt kind of, well, flimsy. That's the price you're going to pay if you want something in this light. You're not going to get something that feels like cold steel in your hands. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't seem undurable in any way. But anyway, the keyboard. 
it is weird folks it is really totally weird what it is is probably i'm guessing a japanese keyboard since this was designed by nec at, primarily for their home market you have the oversized enter key which is a hallmark generally speaking of asian keyboards we have these two bizarre little shorty keys on each side where on an asian keyboard we used to switch between pinion and say kanji characters in this case it's also nec sells in china so they have chinese keyboards other weird things about it. Well, the shift key. Look how teeny the shift key is. The whole right side of the keyboard is just kind of weird. Notice this key is the same as this key. Why do we have this twice? I really can't imagine that. And then we have the usual backspace key. The delete key has been moved down here just to make you really kind of crazy. And we have a backspace here, but that's okay. But we have a forward space, which basically means a space, a space bar. So we have a mini me space bar and we have a full size space bar. For those of us who are touch typists, it just kind of weirds you out. The lead key being in the wrong place, particularly the oversized enter key, the undersized, far undersized shift key. And the shift key is a far reach over. Some people, I wouldn't blame them if they wanted to use a third-party key remapping utility and switch the, the menu button with the shift key, so to bring it at least a little bit closer. The A, B, C, D stuff, you know, the actual letters, that works fine. For those of you who are not big-time word content creators like, well, reviewers are like me, you, you'd probably be okay with it. But this is not a writer's keyboard by any means. The key travel is also very shallow. The super thin design necessitates that. So it's not bad. It's damped. It's crisp, but it, it's, it's really shallow. It doesn't feel as good as, say, the 12-inch Retina MacBooks keyboard, which is a weird feeling keyboard, but a keyboard that kind of really works and you can type on it quite well. It's also not backlit. Wonder of wonders. I don't know why that is. The FN row, this is not a Lenovo Lights keyboard. It's too bad. If, if Lenovo got their hands on this and designed it, well, you can imagine they could do some lovely things here. So you don't have the full multimedia row up here. You have very faintly masked FN functions. You do have to hold down the FN button. You have your brightness controls there, your volume control, a couple of other things, uh, wireless on and off. Pretty hard to see those unless the lighting is very good, and you will have to hold down the FN key to actuate those. So the keyboard, not good for those of you who are writers who spend a lot of time typing out. If you don't, you'll be okay with it. Like I said, A, B, C, D, that stuff is okay as long as you don't mind a real shallow keyboard. Trackpad, on the other hand, which is actually made by Alon, and usually I have to say Synaptics does the better job. This Alon trackpad is awesome. It really is very good. It is precise. It is predictable. Multi-touch gestures, pinch zooming, things like that work very nicely on it. I love it. There are a few trackpads that don't make me miss the, the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air trackpad, but really good trackpad on this. So at least one thing's good on here. Now when I was talking about it feeling a little bit light and plasticky, even though it, it actually is a metal alloy, when I took off the bottom cover, it made that satisfying kind of metal sound. There is some torsion here. For those of you who hate that, if you want to see how much there is, you can do that much wiggling. I mean, it's designed to be thin and light and to bend safely, but some people really hate that. The bottom section, I can't really twist this very much. It moves just a teeny bit. I would consider it abuse to really work it any harder to try to make it bend on the bottom side. So that's the way that is. In terms of performance, this is one of the faster Ultrabooks that you're going to find with ULV Core i5, i7 family CPUs. In this case, only i7s are available. So the core i7 in this, 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gig M2 SSD, scored very well on benchmarks among core i7 Ultrabooks. 15 watt CPU, the usual stuff. You can see the Geekbench 3 score here, 3,076 for single core, 6429 for multi-core. That is a very good score. And it's really impressive for something this thin and this light that doesn't actually melt down when you stress it. PC Mark 8, we run the home accelerated test. You can see the score right there, 2824. It's also a respectable score for that. PC Mark 7 is scored 5283. Usually we see between 4,800 and 5,000. So that's pretty impressive. It does help that it has that Core i7 5500 U on board. W Prime, it computed Pi in 17. 0.34 seconds. And here's how the SSD did. Crystal disk mark is the benchmark that we use to measure SSD speeds, and those are very respectable numbers. Again, fast storage on board, so good. So how about that sharp display? Uh, 
it reminds me a lot of the Dell XPS 13 display, and that's not a bad thing. And auto brightness seems to be actually controllable here, unlike the XPS 13. And you can see color gamut, 99% of sRGB. It also managed 77% of Adobe RGB. So for those of you who do professional imaging, you work with photographs or video and you need accurate color, once you calibrate it, you've got good color gamut here and you've got reasonably good calibration. IGSO displays are very good at not consuming a whole lot of power but seeming reasonably bright. This one measured at 200 nits of brightness, so not super duper bright. It's also very hard to measure brightness on IGSO displays. So I will say that that might not be the most accurate measuring of brightness. It's adequately bright. It's not super duper bright in terms of when I look at it with my eyes, the impression that I get and how well it deals with things like our studio lighting. Overall, it is a nice display. So how about battery life? I, you know, when you're talking about something this thin, this light, something got to give, right? It has a six cell battery inside, supposedly. And Lenovo claims up to nine hours of video playback, seven hours of regular use. I've found so far that it averages about six hours of everyday normal use, which for me would be using Word, using Excel, streaming an hour of Netflix, playing some YouTube videos on it, editing some raw files in Photoshop, doing social networking, that sort of thing. If you're going to be gaming on this, not that this is designed for gaming again, but if you're going to be doing gaming on this, if you're going to spend a lot of time editing and exporting video, you'll get shorter run times. If you're just doing everyday office stuff, you might actually get longer. And that's with the brightness set at 50%, which is pretty doable and usable, and Wi-Fi on and active. So not super duper battery life there, but it's not hideous given again how thin and light it is. And interestingly, uh, there's supposed to be a slightly higher capacity battery in the, the touchscreen model, therefore we didn't really see much of a difference in run times between the two, maybe 10-15 minutes at most, which isn't all that much of a difference considering. Of course both of these have the same display panel, same display resolution here, so they're driving the same internals and the same display panel. So that's the Lenovo La VZ and the La VZ360. Both of these are available now. Currently the lightest 13.3 inch Ultrabooks you can buy and it, it, it is like I said trivially light. As light as the 12 inch MacBook yet you got 13.3 inch computer with a full core i7 in here, ample RAM and a good size SSD drive. There's even somewhat serviceable parts when you take off the bottom. So there's some good things to be said about this. The Sharp IGSO display, once calibrated, looks quite nice on this high resolution. Uh, the keyboard is just bizarre, bizarro. I mean, basically it's an Asian keyboard that hasn't been readapted. So we have keys placements, particularly on the right hand side that aren't ideal. For those of you who don't do a whole lot of typing, it's probably okay. But for those of you who do do a lot of typing, this won't be your first choice. There's also key travel too. Beyond that, they may be pricey, but you're just not gonna find anything this crazy like. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit mobiletechreview.com for our full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel.